My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq. Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible. Affordable. Relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810. Welcome to another episode of He Said, She Said. I'm one of your hosts, Aggie, and with me is the ever-lovable Mickey. How are you, Mickey? I am good. I am Mickey Blowtorch, and I'm coming at you live from years of repressed teen angst. How are you doing? <laughs> this, is, this is the thing I look forward to the most, is where you're coming from every single episode. <laughs> Because it's always something different. <laughs> I, 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 I'm a mobile journalist. I'm traveling around for the sake of the show. I, I have to I have to maintain a um, I guess a wide diverse uh, area there, so I can bring you the best content every single episode. Oh, oh yes, oh yes, definitely. I I just think it, it's going to be funny when you when you come visit and you say coming to you live from Aggie's craft room, and it'll be true. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it will be sometime in the future, hopefully. So, is our our producer Lou? If you want to say hi, Lou, we don't uh, obviously uh, give you enough enough acknowledgments and accolades, but Lou keeps the show flowing for us. Hi, Lou. (laughs) (laughs) Lou's awesome. Produces us. Uh, So, yeah, uh, last week 
we didn't have a show. I was feeling under the weather. Yes, we were. All, we all had the sads because of that. Sad. But you know, we're glad that you're feeling much improved. I I am feeling better. I've actually got a cocktail with me this evening. Do you have a cocktail? I do not. I had one earlier, though. I had um, a lemon drop, so I might fix one at the break, though. I, I, might I think fix you one. should, because I, I also have a, a mango white claw waiting for me downstairs for the break. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I thought I'd just get a little crazy and throw some caution to the wind tonight. Well, well that's what I'm doing. I have not... I've been... I've been trying to lose a little weight um, prior to Halloween and everything so that I can fit into my costume. And so I've been eating more fruits and vegetables, drinking a lot of water, not not imbibing a lot or anything. So, And today I said, you know what? Fuck it. I'm having a drink. Good <laughs> so for you. <laughs> so we got it. Yeah, it was great. Ready? Huh? You 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 did pick out a costume. I did, but I the reveal is always on Halloween. So okay, always on Halloween. So I can't, I I can only say that this is it's a mashup. So it'll be interesting. <laughs> I, am, uh, I don't think I'm going to dress up this year. If I do, I'll probably just I've got a box of like three or four costumes sitting up in the closet in the guest room. Uh-huh. And uh, the first year that I moved into the house, actually, Halloween rolled around. And I, my neighborhood's really cool for Halloween. And this year's going to be a bummer, but whatever. So my neighborhood is a gated HOA. I, you know, that, that's a long story of why I'm in an HOA to begin with, but I'm here. And so everybody told me, they're like, hey, Halloween's really cool. And I'm like, whatever, man. I just thought it would be the same lame shit that you always see. So... It ends up being like a street festival here. Just thousands of people on the street. Everybody swarms to the neighborhood before they close the gates at 6 p.m. And then as soon as the sun starts setting, the neighbors and I always pulled our barbecue grills into the driveways and grilled up hot dogs and hamburgers for all of the parents and the kids. And that oh, was that's awesome. because I got to see, um, you know, all the soccer moms and all of that shit. And I was happy with that. But what happened was the first year I had moved into the neighborhood, I was I bought some candy, uh, like just like a Walgreens five pound bag or a three pound bag, some some bullshit like that, and it was gone in ten minutes. And so I was looking outside, and it the streets looked awesome. There were people walking around on big stilts. It just looked cool, and almost every house was participating that particular year. So I went upstairs to this box I have of like a couple different costumes, and I have a cow costume that has udders and a cute little hood. So I put that shit on and I went outside and introduced myself to the neighbor. <laughs> and that's how I met them. And that's how I met a couple soccer moms too. They were like, Oh my God, my son just loves cows. Can he have your picture with you? And so that just, you know, ever since then I'm like, yeah, I'm dressing up every year. And, um, unfortunately because of the COVID situation, we won't be doing that this year. So hopefully next year, but, um, yeah, I might, I don't Hopefully, know, we'll yeah. see what happens. I'll, I'm going to look outside and see if there's any, any kind of activity and maybe I'll dress up. Maybe I won't. I'm hoping you dress up because I don't want to be alone in my, I, I want some, someone with solidarity here. I, <laughs> my sister's just like, I'm shutting off all the lights. I'm not dressing up. You know, they, they can go get candy somewhere else. I'm like, wow. <laughs> She's yeah. such a grump. <laughs> oh. Me, I'll have the full size, you know, candy bars and packages and stuff. And everybody loves my house. <laughs> so I always dress up. But I always dress up for the adults. I never dress up for the kids. The kids never understand my costume. Your because costume it's always something. Always so cool. I, yeah, but, you know, a kid wouldn't understand, you know, June Cleaver. I don't know who she is. Yeah, <laughs> so, or Tippi Hedren. Yes, but the, but the adults do, you know. And, I mean, that Tippi Hedren costume, I had so many adults just, I, they took my picture. <laughs> they took pictures with me. <laughs> it was hilarious. <laughs> it, was, it was cracking me up because it was like, 
like I was a superhero or something <laughs> <laughs> with all these dead crows on me. <laughs> they were so perfect. That Tippy Hedren costume from the birds that you wore that year was just so detailed. It was, um, it was, I, I remember when I had first met you and we were talking about it and you had mentioned that you had gone as her one year for Halloween. And I thought, Oh, you know, that's cool. And I'm like, Hey, you know, send me a picture. If you ever come across one, cause I was interested and I thought it was cool. And then you sent me the picture. I could not believe how awesomely detailed it was. It was incredible. I had, I even had a blonde wig, but it refused to, um, uh, it, it wouldn't comb the hair right into a, a bun like, uh, like she had in the movie. So, um, so I just went with the dark, my dark hair. And instead of tipi, I was tipa, which is the Spanish form for chick. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. My my dad thought it was hilarious. And he, of course, you know, he, he told me to send him a picture and, and I had posted a picture. Uh, uh, so I sent it to him. And so he sent it to all my relatives in Puerto Rico and they just thought it was great. You know, <laughs> so that was that was one of the fun ones. That was one of the fun ones. And of course, last year's was um, the fairy wine mother. <laughs> I don't think I saw that one. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll send it to you. Okay. Um, yeah, it was. I was dressed in like I had a, a tutu, and my 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 crown was actually wine corks and wine grapes, and I had, I had a little I had a little wine glass and a small bottle of wine tied to a belt on on my hip, and it was pretty funny. <laughs> That's adorable. <laughs> yeah, it was uh my sister is actually I think the the one the one that lives in DC wanted to borrow the the, the costume. So I sent it to her and she's going to be dressed up like that this year. So I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> Last year. So, yes. Um I have you ever seen pictures of Fidel Castro when he was young? Oh, yes. Yes. We have a lot I'm from Puerto Rico, so yeah. I've got a lot of similar features of you do. Uh, <laughs> young Fidel Castro, yeah. <laughs> facial features, the cheekbones, the nose. Very similar, almost like we could be related. In fact, uh, do you know Janie Mack on Twitter at all? Yes. She always busts my balls and says that I'm Justin Trudeau's uh half brother. <laughs> <laughs> God love her. <laughs> so I I had taken a black and white photo of me and the girl at the time, and I just looked at the photo and thought, holy shit, I look exactly like young Fidel. And so for Halloween last year, I uh, bought an olive drab suit with a green hat, and I got some, uh, some old Ray-Ban sunglasses, like the popular ones from the 50s, you know? Almost uh -huh. like the ones. And I, I got some, um, uh, just for men, beard coloring and I dyed my beard black and I was Fidel Castro for Halloween. Oh and, my uh, word. And my girlfriend was, um, <laughs> she dressed up like this, uh, militant paratrooper and I got a black beret for her and put a star on it. And we said she was Che Mascara. <laughs> Mascara. It was cute. I took the pictures <laughs> offline, but it, it was hilarious. I, I can't believe how much I look like Fidel Castro. It's almost creepy. It, it, it is. I, and it's something I actually noticed and, but I didn't say anything because you, you obviously don't have the right hair coloring or the facial coloring, you know, the, the skin coloring, but, um, but yeah. I was struck by the similarities. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. I'll, I'll send you the picture and I'll send you the black and white photo too, that I had the comparison with it. I thought that I looked like him, but hilarious. So I guess uh, Halloween, we're kind of getting into some spookier topics. Mm -hmm. Yes, we the sure are. Last episode that we did live, since we weren't live last week, was uh, our favorite scary movies. What did we do? Scary movies that scared us as children and scary movies that we love as adults. I thought right. that was a great episode. I really had a lot of fun with that. Oh, it was. It was fun. I, I had to, like, uh, I, I went back and found some of the ones from when I was, um, that I enjoyed. Obviously not the ones that scared me as children because I am still scarred, but um, 
but you know, I, I, I pulled up Fright Night and watched, I've watched it a couple of times so far. <laughs> Fright Night's on Prime, I think. I think so, yeah. I, I, gotta, so. I love Fright Night. That was, that was, I think that was my top one for the uh, uh, scary movie list, if I recall. This week, though, we're doing something cool. We're doing, uh, and, and we're changing our format a little bit. We're seeing if we can uh, make it last or catch on um, on a, uh, I say um way too much, too. I just noticed that. Yeah, so do I. So we came up with the instead of doing top fives, we're doing top threes and seeing if we can get top threes to become a pop culture phenomenon since Aggie and I are such awesome trendsetters. So we're doing <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> our top three list of local urban legends. I'm doing local legends from El Paso, and Aggie's going to do local legends from her neck of the woods. And then we're going to do our top three worldwide urban legends that happen to be our favorite urban legends so that's where we're sitting at and that's what we're gonna do tonight urban legends and bullshit <laughs> get some X-Files music playing here you know something that people don't know about me and i really don't ever have a reason to tell anybody i'm kind of like this real big closet paranormal geek like Fox Mulder on the X Files, I really relate to that guy. Except for uh, oh, I my, bet you do. My exterior, I'm I'm total crazy party guy, but like my secret passion on the inside is I love conspiracy theories. I love the paranormal, love UFO stuff. I follow all that. If there's a documentary on, boom, I'm watching it. I'm I'm totally a secret geeky closet um, Fox Mulder. I I totally see it. I do. <laughs> I totally see it. So without uh, further ado, would you like to start us off? Do you want to start with local urban legends? I think that's a good place. I think to... local, local is what, yeah, let's start with local. Um, it's a lot of people know this one, and I'm sure that's one of your local ones, too. Because if you lived in Texas and lived in the, in the Rio Grande River area, this Urban legend stood out above all others. You, I and guess you already picked my number one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That, 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 that's that's number about. one. Is she, is she you, a wailing you know? woman? Huh? Is she a wailing woman? Yes, La uh -huh. Llorona. <laughs> of course, tell us about La Llorona. And there's several different, um, several different versions of it, and yeah. every place amongst the Rio Grande Valley has got their own. El Paso owns it. I'm sure you guys own it. Everybody owns it and thinks it's theirs, but it's really widespread, which is kind of well, cool. About it. Well, it's it's really interesting because the one that I heard of La Llorona is absolutely different from the one that I heard in El Paso. So growing up, it was a completely different thing, but it was still some chick that was crying over her children. And um, when I was growing up, I grew up in way, way, way South Texas, and uh, there were two urban legends that people like to freak others with, and that was like the top one. It's the top and one. And it was a legend. Yeah, it's the top one. Ever. I mean, they've made movies out of it, right? <laughs> like your older, your older cousins and brothers and sisters would use that shit just to scare the hell out of you, or a really mean aunt, you know? And I remember being eight years old down here and just pissing my pants thinking about that woman going up and down the river. Tell us the, um, the version that you guys had down there. Our version was slightly different. It didn't actually take place in the river. It took place at a junction of two major roads. And apparently this woman was, um, had two children it's always two children. I've noticed that. All of them have two kids. Yes. Um, and it's a boy and a girl. And she had two children, and she was actually very poor and destitute. And she found some guy that fell in love with her but didn't want her children. And so she left her children tied up, left them to die. And... In in that respect, I think that's why it's different because this one is actually not at the river; it's at a crossroads, and the children 
end up dying, you know, they get run over or something. Now, I don't, at the time, that cro particular crossroads had a train running through it. So maybe it was the train, but I don't know. Was it tied I, to a particular I, crossroads from the area? Like a real crossroads that existed? Yes. So, yes. like, would people go down there and do, like, oh, let's go yes. and do weird We shit. actually did, Mickey, one time. I was 14. <laughs> my friends decided to go over there, and, and we convinced one of my friend's parents to actually take us, like, at 10 o'clock at night. And my dad, my dad and my mom were like, you're going to get freaked out. You're not going to sleep. And I'm like, but I got to know. I got to know. I got to know. And they said, well, well, you know, if Linda's going to take you, that's fine. Go ahead. No problem. But I don't want to hear you being scared. And I don't want you complaining and blah, 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 and all that stuff. And I'm like, I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to complain. And so we go over there. And, of course, you know, Miss Linda is is um, my friend Rosa, Ro uh, Rosalinda's uh, mother. And so we're, there's like four of us in the car. And so we park the car and we turn off the lights and then we begin to wait. Of course, we have like a two hour wait because everything happens at midnight, right? Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> hour. And oh my God, it was so, it was so funny. We didn't see anything, but Miss Linda decided to actually make fun of us. <laughs> and she started crying and saying that she is now La Llorona and she's got to tie us all up. And we just started screaming. We were screaming in the car and she just finally busted out laughing. It's like, I'm taking you home. <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> but I, that was, but I think, I think the one in El Paso is different because it actually takes place in the river, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, El, El Paso and, and Juarez are separated by the Rio Grande. Right. And in fact, the Rio Grande is a huge part of El Paso lore, no matter if you're talking about old gunfighters or just like yes, movies from the 70s. There's always something to do with the Rio Grande, kind of a nod or a mention, but it's a huge part of our lives here, a huge part of our cultures, and that's where the actual border is. That's that's where the, the, the cops and robbers games takes place between uh, uh, drug smugglers or, uh, or immigrants coming across in the Border Patrol. All happens down in the river. Cowboys and... Um, and gun gunfighters. We got a huge uh, history of cowboys and gunfighters down here too. Everything that took place on the in El Paso always was centered around the Rio. In fact, uh, I think there's even a couple mentions in Young Guns. I was watching the Young Guns movies a couple weeks ago, and they've got some nods to crossing the river and going down into uh, Juarez. But I I've got a nice twist to the La Llorona story when I get to my number one, because that's such a fantastic piece of lore. And it really has spread from coast to coast on the southern border. Awesome. <laughs> so my number three of local urban legends being in El Paso, and this is one of my most favorites. I've been obsessed with this particular one since I was a kid. It's um, the Patterson disappearance. March 6th of 1957, there was this family, a renowned family, a husband and a wife, no children, named uh, William and Margaret Patterson. They just up and vanished for absolutely no reason. He was a photographer, so he would spend time going around town taking pictures. He had a studio, things of that nature, and uh, I think his wife was just a homemaker. I'm not too sure. What happened was... Uh, they had a neighbor go deliver Girl Scout cookies, I think, on the evening of March 5th. And that neighbor said that they acted really weird. They felt unwelcome, and so they left right away after delivering the cookies. After that, nobody ever heard from them again. Their, uh, their luggage, their clothes, they had food on the table. Nothing in the house had been disturbed. There was no sign of a struggle. Nothing had been packed. They just vanished as they were, you know, uh, clothes on their backs. It's it's become a, a cold case here locally, and I think we just closed it a couple of years ago because there is nothing going to come forward. But it, it remained open, and it became a huge part of local lore. It ranges anything from alien abductions to espionage. And what I actually believe is I think that they were Russian spies. This was at the height of the Cold War, 
And El Paso was a hotbed for Operation Paperclip, which was when we brought Nazi scientists to America. Right, right. You know, That's like right. Braun, who was the father of our space program. But El Paso hosted a lot of these Germans that came from Operation Paperclip. And we had a huge German community here. In fact, we had German restaurants for years because of that German population. Yeah. A, a huge subculture here locally. And we've got uh, we've got Fort Bliss, which is a massive military installation. We've got White Sands in Alamogordo. You know, when we all know what happened out at White Sands in Alamogordo, that's where we birthed the atomic bomb for the the United States of America. That's where it all that's happened. Right. It all that's happened right. down here. So El Paso would have been a perfect place for Russian operatives to have conducted. And I don't know if you've ever seen a show called The Americans. There were so yes. many. Russian spies in the United States, and we never caught them because we're a free country. We, you don't need to have papers going from checkpoint to checkpoint, shit like that. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it was easy for the Russians to get somebody in here with all of the perfect documentation and lead a life. This guy was a photographer and was seen taking pictures around the bases. Nobody ever said shit because he was a photographer, and they're like, oh, that's just William Patterson doing his photography thing. I think they were Russian spies. I think something happened. And I think that they just simply dropped what they were doing, drove their car over the bridge into Mexico, and caught a flight back to Russia. They probably went from Mexico to Cuba and from Cuba to Russia. Just my guess. That's the feeling I have about them. It turned into a huge thing uh, locally. And like I said, anything from devil worshipping to UFO abduction has all been theorized on this particular case. And I even get goosebumps just talking about it. I get super excited about it. Oh, man, that, that sounds fun to, like, really research. Three years ago, my dad gave me this huge box of, of these vintage books that belonged to my great aunt. And they're books from the 1800s. I've got, I've got like, an early edition of Uncle Tom's Cabin. I've got Shakespeare from the 1800s. All kinds of crazy <gasps> books. Just, and, and they're beautiful, in beautiful condition. I was... I like to just pick one up off my bookshelf once in a while, and I'll just open it up and flip through the pages because they're so cool. And one night, I when I first inherited the collection, I opened it up, and there was a magazine or a newspaper cutout of the Patterson disappearance from when they disappeared in the book. My great aunt had snipped it from the paper and put it in a book and used it as a bookmarker. Oh no, shit! <laughs> cool, <huh? laughs> That's very cool. That's pretty awesome. That I, I would love to like really research that one because that one has a lot of possibilities. You know, it's so a true possibly. mystery. And El, you know, El Paso is a sleepy city, and we're so underestimated from the weird shit that goes on behind the the curtain. I mean, we have got probably the biggest federal law enforcement presence outside of Washington, D.C. over here than anywhere else in the country. You just never expect anything from us because we're just we're just a happy little city. We like getting drunk. We like having our barbecues and our backyard hangouts, shit like that. I think that's why things like that kind of go under the uh, the ripple there. And before I go off on a crazier tangent, I say we go to uh, we're at the bottom of the hour or top of the hour, rather, and let's go to a break and. We'll come back and we'll finish our list up. Okie dokie. <laughs> <laughs>
Either way, you win. Talk to us today at 800-CHANCE or go to rocketmortgage.com to take advantage. Here's another great reason to work with us. For a record nine years in a row, J.D. Power has ranked with the number one house in the nation in customer satisfaction for primary mortgage origination. Again, to lock in today's low mortgage interest rate and get the security of our exclusive Rich Shield approval, call us today at 800-CHANCE or go to rocketmortgage.com. J.D. Power Mortgage Company, member of NMLS. Advantage of the Lending Body Credit Union of Missouri. Offer not subject to change terms and conditions. Offer not subject to change terms and conditions. Equal housing lender. Hi, welcome to this summary ad for the new Chesapeake Ginger Glaze Chicken Finger Fillet. How would you like it? Honestly, um... More pronounced than at home? Yeah. How'd you like it, Matt? My wife picked up the new chicken for wraps. It's got double the rotisserie style chicken mix with a Chesapeake Ginger Glaze. She appears annoyed at me, but she shrugs it off. Her sweet and savory flavors are calling her name. She limps around there. are back talking to you guys about our favorite urban legends <sighs> okay i had to turn on a couple of lights <laughs> <I'll be honest. laughs> i was like okay it's a little dark in my craft room i better turn on the lights <laughs> nope. Nope. Say the bottom half of the hour is the darkest <laughs> great okay so shut up Okay, right, so, so we, we got through our first two. Okay, so our our number two, my for, number two, for local is actually for- it's local. It's a local one, um, or semi-local. It's um, it takes place in the free uh, Frio River area, and it's the White Lady of the Rio Frio. Ooh. Frio, for those who don't know a lot of Spanish, means cold, and it's. It's one of my favorite rivers in Texas. Um, it's great for uh, fishing, tubing, uh, rafting, you know, kayaking. It depends on which section you do because it, it's got it all. So it's one of my favorite places. But apparently there was, uh, the story goes that there were two very beautiful young women who lived in that area. And um, Maria was uh, one of them. Uh, that's the, the one that became the white lady. Uh, her sister got married uh, and had children and was very happy. And Maria aspired to meet a man who would love her and ha- so that she could have children of her own. It is the only thing that she aspired it was to be a mother. And so she finally met a young man and they fell in love. But unbeknownst to Maria, her brother-in-law was also in love with her and one night he confessed her his feelings for her she kind of freaked out because that's her brother-in-law in In fact in in, and you know in hispanic culture is a brother-in-law is literally your brother too so for her it was kind of like an icky situation she's like uh dude no i'm out (laughs) and she went back to her house uh, sometime later, she hears a noise and she thinks it's her beloved. And so she opens the door and it's the brother-in-law standing there. And he is enraged and kills her. He shoots her. And so she died 
not having married, not having had any children. So the legend goes that there is this white lady that actually lives and haunts the Rio Frio area. But she is a good soul. And she, what she does is she tries to protect children. And, you know, they, a lot of people say that they have seen this white spirit actually comfort their sick child or, you know, um, make a cold child feel warm again, you know, that kind of thing. So she actually seeks out children that need comfort and provides comfort to the children. So it's a really, it's a really cool urban legend in that it's not haunting. It's not you know, terribly, it, it, the, the sadness did not it's, translate towards the death after death. So, yeah, yeah. So are, she are basically decided people like uh, guide them away from danger. Or, you know, is there anything specific that she's been known to do to help? Uh, I think if I recall, there was one case where um, there was a child who was very, very sick, had a very uh, high fever. And uh, the parents, you know, they were, you know, administering aid and everything. And all the doctor could do was, you know, give them like baby aspirin or, or whatever. There was nothing to be done. This was back, I want to say, in the 50s or 60s, if I recall. And, you know, the parents kept vigil, and the mom was awake when she saw this spirit uh, completely envelop the child and noticed that the child's temperature, you know, the, the child started, you know, started breaking a sweat and became calm and wasn't fitful anymore. And when she went to touch him, he, the, the the child he I think it was a male he, he was very nice and cool to the touch and this this white mist was still around the child and the mom didn't know what to do about it or anything and and she just kept praying and praying and praying and then you know then you know once she was done praying she looks up and the 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 mist is hovering over the child and then it disappeared. And the child was fine. No, no more fever, you know. So, um, I think that's that's one of the ones that I recall being being told. And it was, you know, for me, it was like that's the kind of urban legend I like. That's cool. I, <laughs> I don't, I don't want the creepiness. <laughs> no, there, you know, there, I think that the benevolent uh, stories are far and few between because it's always something menacing and scary. Because that's yeah. real. The, uh, I guess the uh, climax of wanting to be scared. You want to be scared. It's, it's like an orgasm of the mind. People seek that out. That's why you go to haunted houses. That everybody likes to get scared. And I've never really understood that because I've never particularly liked being scared. No, no, I I do not. And and I I'm I'm actually putting something out there that can be detrimental to my mental health later on with you people, but I do not like being scared. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's such a cool story. I'm gonna have to read further about that. In fact, I'll, I'll probably do that when I crawl into bed tonight. Yeah, the better. white I believe it's called the White Lady of Rio Frio. Rio Frio, and of course, White Lady translates into Karen. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> My Spanish is getting pretty good. His Spanish is in fuego. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, my number two. This one is very uh, localized, but there's a little tiny suburb, and it's not really suburb. We've got these little villages. I ten runs through El Paso, mm -hmm. east and west. Yeah. On yeah. the east and west side, we have these little tiny villages as you leave El Paso, right? We've got little villages like Fabens that were Dr. Scott's from. That's where he grew up. That's uh, right. Yeah. Just, we've got San Elizario, where Billy the Kid stayed a night in the jail cell there. And I have actually been in the same jail cell. Me too. You've been in San Elizario? <laughs> yes. That's crazy. <laughs> I've been there. So there's all these little villages, and there's a, a tiny little village called Horizon City to the east of us. And this story kind of dates back to the 70s. 
something called the the Horizon City or East Lake, which is a major uh, road that goes through the uh, Horizon City. Well, it's not major, but it's their main road. And so they've got the Horizon City or the East Lake Monster. So this is kind of our local Sasquatch. It goes back Ooh, to the cool. seven. Uh, apparently, it's got dark brown fur and stands like a gorilla. There was a, I read a news article about a woman that reported it, I want to say, within the last 15 years. She saw it standing on, on East Lake Boulevard. And she said it was over seven foot tall. The police investigated it. They were obligated to investigate. But the police official statement was they believed it was a hoax. However, comma, the same story has been surfacing since the 70s. Now, there's also a local theory going back to the 70s. Um, We had a, a hermit that was living in some kind of tiny little cave just on the outskirts of town. Nobody really knew where he was staying, but there had been sightings of him. And he had long hair, a huge long beard, just totally, you know, looking like a hermit would look. I guess he had a little cave. There was a bunch of hunters, apparently, that found his campsite. I don't know if they were part of a posse or if they were just out there looking around. But apparently he had just been staying out there on his own and kind of living off the grid. So that's one theory about it. But people once in a while, especially the people that live down in Horizon City, which they're they're a little interesting. It's kind of a different breed there. But all of them know about the the Horizon City monster, who's some kind of desert Sasquatch. And I spent a lot of time working in that particular area when I had first gotten out of the military and moved down here in my uh, early twenties. And I remember one night, you know, I, and I actually worked in the middle of the desert, so you see weird shit all the time. From people on horseback to people crossing with things they probably shouldn't cross. You you see weird shit in the desert, especially that close to the border. And we're talking just like maybe a mile, two miles from the border itself. (laughs) One night I was working out there. (sighs) Gigantic looking. I couldn't tell if it was like a 200 pound rabbit or if it was this, this gigantic coyote. But it was yellow and it looked mangy. And it didn't walk normal like anything that I could have ever described. And it was probably 200 yards away from me. I watched it cross through like a little culvert area and then just walk into the desert. It really had a weird stride. It was very unnatural. I grew up in the the Rocky Mountains. I'm pretty familiar with wildlife. You know, I've, I've been a hunter. I can identify animals and shit like that. And on top of the the time that I spent in the military... I just knew that this thing was fucking unnatural. It was weird as shit. So that's my uh, that's my number two, the Horizon City monster, kind of a Sasquatch in our local little area. And what's so funny about that is it, it's so it's so concentrated in the, just this little particular area that legend has never moved past that that um, and it's a tiny area too. Just that area. yeah, yeah, it's very small area. And now, excuse me, I have to turn on yet another light. <laughs> it just keeps on getting bigger. It does. Because my number one is like super creepy. It has always creeped me out. Mm, creep me out. Give it to me. It, it's the infamous Chupacabra. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, and I'm sure everybody is very familiar with the chupacabra. Um, to, for those that are not very familiar with Spanish, chupacabra literally means goat sucker. Okay, um, you know, chupa, chupa means to suck, and cabra is goat. Sucked. And it's 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 not it's a legend that has just I every almost every Latin American country has this legend. Is, I can, mean, I remember this where, legend in Puerto Rico. Huh? Do you know where it originated? I think no. the heaviest influence it's had in my travels has been Puerto Rico. Yeah. Well, you know, growing up, that we heard this thing about this thing. And let me tell you something. <laughs> my grandmother had no problem sending us out into the wilds of that mountain that, that they 
group coffee in. And as a parting shot, she would tell us, just watch for the chupacabra, okay? And if, if you get in trouble, just holler. Nobody can hear you scream in the side of the mountain. Nobody can hear you. <laughs> so, of course, we couldn't sleep or anything whenever we went camping. <laughs> but it's really weird because I have, you know, it, and this was when I was young. But when I would go back for, uh, for visits and stuff like that, I, there were reports in the news about livestock that had been drained of their blood completely and they had like just one or two puncture uh, marks um, near their their throat or whatever and I you know I it was completely unexplained the vets couldn't understand that you know they would perform autopsies on the livestock they they just could not figure out how this was going on but, you know, and, and eventually it just went through almost every single Latin American country because, you know, we, we even have there's there's a there's a restaurant here. <laughs> there is. Chupacabrito. <laughs> <laughs> it's Mexican food and it's apparently it's a pretty cool place to hang out. But I have yet to muster the courage to go to this place and it, and it's really cute because the little the, the little critter is this little goat with like fangs it's really That's cute, cute. That's but cute. yeah so so this this is possibly the biggest one here at the moment you know everybody knows the chupacabra you know oh, it's this <laughs> this this huge thing that has you know it, it has it's spikes, gone, it has claws. It's only gone mainstream in the last, I want to say, 15 years or so. I didn't well, know I remember, really you may have been, I don't know if you were, do you remember that show, Unsolved Mysteries? Yes. Okay, so or, back in 95. <laughs> for a kid, you knew some scary shit was about to go down. Yes, it was so great. Back in, I want to say it was 95. Could have been 96, one of those two seasons. They had a show, you know, that was that was the subject of one of their episodes. That is the only episode I never watched. I am not kidding. I refused to watch it just because I knew it was going to be all freaky and everything because it's an unsolved mystery. What I loved about that show was that some of the mysteries that they would show eventually got solved because they showed them, you know, the updates at the end. Yes, it was really cool. But that one, I think that's the one episode I did not see of that entire show. And let me tell you, I watched that show all avidly all the time. I loved it. I loved Robert Stack. He had the best, he was so, so cool. He was just awesome. Uh, but yeah, that's the episode I did not watch. I was not going to put myself in that position. <laughs> Super Copper is a fantastic urban legend. And, and like I said, I, I spent uh, several years in Puerto Rico when I was in the Navy. And that was a big deal down there. It, it's it they, they said Anything from it's an alien to an alien vampire to just like a little witch monster to even like a... Uh, a naval experiment. They, bl I, I saw a documentary where they blamed it on the the base there. Yes, it, um, I believe, and this is my uncle is uh, he's a Green Party person. And to explain to um, our uh, listeners, the Green Party in Puerto Rico does not mean like the Green Party here. It's uh -oh. independent. Like the uh, were were they a. They weren't one of the terrorist groups, were they? Like the Machicheros? Uh, I believe some of them were part of the Green Party, but I'm not sure. But Green Party just means you want independence for Puerto Rico. You don't want the yeah. U.S. You don't, you know, you don't want statehood. You want to be completely independent. So I, um, a lot of that, he was you know, 19 and 20, and and all of the young people in Puerto Rico wanting their independence. That's a story for another time, though. Oh but, yeah. I was there. I saw it. I, I've seen the protests. We had a big deal with Vieques. Yes, and it was, um, you know, and I, it, it was it was funny because he is convinced that it was a, an experiment that was done in Vieques and loosed on the island 
to teach us a lesson. <laughs> he will die on that hill, let me tell you. He yeah. really will. And, I, and I'm like, dude, I don't know where this thing came from. And I don't know. I, I have no idea. But I'm pretty freaking sure that this thing was hanging around well before we had Navy at Vieques. Because oh, just, my uh, grandmother remembered this when she was a kid. <laughs> So, but you know, there's there's no there's no reasoning with him. He's fantastic. On on a side note, my uh my Mel Review stage name is actually Chalupa Cabra. Oh, that's that's <laughs> another story for another show. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you ever hear of Chalupa Cabra debuting, you better go and show your support. I better go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move out of local urban legends and let's get into our top three worldwide urban legends. I know we cut our lists down considerably and we're almost out of time. See? So go first. Give us your number three worldwide urban legend. My number three worldwide urban legend. It's actually from here. It's, uh, it's the Jersey Devil. Oh, yeah, the Jersey Devil. That one is uh, that one has always kind of freaked me out because it was such a weird uh, spawning of it. Uh, and yes, I used the word on, on purpose. <laughs> so supposedly this woman had 12 children. And when she found out she was pregnant, she cursed the baby. And so the night that the baby was born, it was born as the devil. And if Flew out the chimney. So this Jersey Devil, you know, haunts the uh, lower part of the Jersey, and and um, it, huh? He flew out when he was born. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I'm <laughs> Supposedly, it flew out the <laughs> chimney and disappeared. <laughs> so yeah, so that's that's my number three, or number one, or number just, three. I don't know. This terrible mental image of. Uh, I'm not even going to start. My number three of worldwide urban legends is none other than the Men in Black, which <laughs> is a super cool story. However, the story itself really got lost when Hollywood uh, mainstreamed the story with uh, Tommy Lee Jones and Will mm -hmm. Smith, movies, which were fantastic. Which ironically, was I on just, I'm so, not kidding, two hours ago. Oh, God, they play a Men in Black movie every other day. On All TV. the time. <laughs> ridiculous so <laughs> the actual story itself has been around such a long time it dates back to 1947 and it's been around since then there's been multiple multiple sightings of men in black and it still continues to this day i've seen video footage within the last 15 years of men in black going into like a hotel lobby so anyway it starts off june 27th 1947 the puget sound this dude named harold Dahl was out with his son and his dog they were doing some shit in a boat. I don't know if they were fishing, whatever the deal was. Ugh. And they had to, um, I, I, like I said, I don't know what they were doing. So they were in the middle of a lake. That's all I know in, in the Puget Sound area. And they saw six donut-shaped objects in the sky. They were moving erratically, and apparently they were about a mile, or half a mile up above their boat, directly overhead. And one of them fell down about 1,500 feet rapidly and rained down all of these metallic objects, which in turn like kind of burned their clothes a little bit. It killed the dog. It didn't survive the event and gave them, you know, superficial wounds. The following morning, this guy was visited by a man in a black suit driving a black car. They ended up at a local diner where the man was able to recount the story that Dahl had just experienced. And he said, and I quote, what I have said is proof that I know a great deal more about this than of, of this experience of yours than you will want to believe. And he told the man, Dahl, that if you talk about this, bad things are going to happen to you. And that was the end of the meeting. So <laughs> that's super creepy, right? Yeah. They continued throughout history and they always seem to show up after like a UFO sighting or some kind of encounter. And they'll show up. They don't act. Uh, I, I've read reports how they act kind of odd. You know, when you talk to somebody and you know that something's mentally off, you guys aren't like on the same wavelength. They act kind of odd. They they are very awkward. 
but they're very intimidating at the same time. And they're always in black suits. They're always driving black cars and they always show up afterwards. Anybody is witnessed anything. Allegedly. That's the way the story goes. So the men in black is my number three. I think it's a really cool story. I hate how it got kind of lost in the noise of Hollywood, but it's still there and it's still kind of cool. That is neat. That's uh, uh, that's something to look into. You know. Uh, let's see. My number two would have to be the Banshee. Ooh. Yeah. I've always been like you know you 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 grow up you know people saying oh stop screaming like a banshee stop screaming like a banshee and you're like what the fuck is a banshee <laughs> I'm from Puerto Rico man. Help me out here. <laughs> and so I Where's actually went to look that up a lot back. Huh? Where'd you get exposed? Where was your first exposure to the Banshee? Mine was Darby O'Gill and the Little People when I was like five. Well, actually, I did watch Darby O'Gill, but I was 22 when I watched it. And so it finally explained to me what a Banshee was, you know, but, you know, Growing up in school, you know, when you're real loud or whatever, and the teacher's telling you, stop screaming like a banshee. And I had no idea what a banshee was. And for some reason, she would not tell me either. So so then I'm watching this movie because it's one of the uh, movies that's coming out that Disney is releasing. And, of course, uh, I, I had to watch it because, you know, Sean Connery's in it. So, of course. <laughs> and he sings. And he sings in it. For those of you who have never, yeah, he actually sings in Darby O'Gill and the Little People. So people look that up because it's awesome. It's very awesome. But, you know, it's just that the whole concept of a banshee screaming as a symbol of a close family member about to die freaks me out. You know, that is freaky. It's it's not freaky in the sense that, and, and I'm Irish. So it's kind of this one hits close to home for me, and I really love the the story. But the ghost or the banshee itself is a spirit that is almost like a guardian angel of the family. And so when you hear the banshee crying, it's because they're weeping and mourning that they know that one of the people that they care about is going to pass. So it like it, almost every family's got their own banshee. In fact, there's uh, some Kennedys when you know millions of Kennedys have died. And there's a couple of events where they had heard the Banshees crying the night before, like Jack got shot or Bobby was shot. And you can Google that and read about that. It's kind of interesting. Oh, cool. Okay. I didn't mean to steal your Banshee thunder. <laughs> no, no, actually it, it, it helps me actually. It, it kind of, it makes it better. You know, it doesn't make it as scary, but oh, it is scary. mournful and sad, but it is, but it is kind of nice. And uh, the, the, the Banshee really cares about the family that they're with. It's almost like a guardian angel. And I'm sure it probably changes a little bit from from actual Ireland, uh, Irish Americans and whatnot. But the Irish people are really into older Irish people before Catholicism hit the island. You know, they were the ones that were kind of into like fairies and, yes. and things like that. And that's where the Banshee originated. Super right. cool. Yeah. I didn't mean to steal it. No. Super it's cool. I love the Banshee. Okay, so what's your number one? My or that was your number one, I think, or your number no, two. That was two, but Okay. Okay. My number two is two. Skinwalkers. I'll I'll go through this real quick. And ick, some ick, of the ick. Cat <laughs> in Skinwalker. When I was talking about that weird dog I saw. So skinwalkers uh, come from our Native American cultures, uh, most specifically or, or predominantly the Navajo culture is a harmful, like maleficent witch that can shapeshift. So they can allegedly change into like wolves or coyotes or mountain lions, deer, things like that. But they're always up to no good. They're bad energy. They're they're not something you want around. Uh, I can't pronounce the Navajo name for it, but it translates roughly into English as with it goes on all fours. And oh, there's wow. a similar 
kind of like the chupacabra really it Mm -hmm. shared amongst uh all of the indigenous peoples from like the four corners area so we're talking about like the pueblo people the apache the hopi and the ute they all have similar accounts and stories and versions of the skinwalker so i I spent uh i want to say six or seven months down in southern utah when i was in the eighth grade my mother had gotten a job and moved us down there Total shit show. I hated it. it Living in this <laughs> little town, the people were assholes. But the Native Americans were pretty cool. It was uh, very, we were very, it was almost like living on the border here in El Paso, you know, with the Hispanics. The cultures really bleed over into each other. So in the Four Corners area, all of the Native Americans and, and the other people that live in that area bleed over into each other too. We all went to school together. It was pretty balanced out. But a lot of the uh, the Navajo folks down there used to talk about the skinwalkers, and they wouldn't even want to talk about it. You bring it up, and they immediately change the subject. It's a super touchy subject down there. They're super afraid of that thing. And Yikes. I had learned about that, and I always thought that that was kind of a cool thing. Uh, okay. I'm running out of lights to turn on here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> All right, so my number one is really an interesting one. And the reason I have it at number one is because it makes absolutely no sense to me. But apparently it has struck, it's probably the number one in Russia, the Baba Yaga. Um, It's a Baba Yaga is this woman who eats children. (laughs) But, you know, but that's not the weird part. The weird part is that her house is held up off the ground on chicken legs and i just trying to picture that just robs it of any terror i mean who puts chicken legs on <laughs> their house how, 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 how far back does this date <laughs> this the baba <laughs> yaga i think has been around for i want to say centuries it has been a story told to children for for, for a very very long time and I remember uh, when I was little, my grandmother, my father's mother, uh, she was a teacher. And so she had all of these stories and she told us the story of Baba Yaga. And we just, you know, we had the, what you're talking about, Willis, look on our faces <laughs> when she was talking about this because <laughs> we were like, that makes no sense. Chicken feet on a house? That makes no sense. So for us, you know, she was trying to scare us, but we were so distracted by the stupid chicken feet that we didn't care that the chick was actually eating kids. <laughs> You're like, this is stupid. I know, yeah. But apparently it terrified children for from a, for a very long time. So that's one of my favorites, just because of the, the juxtaposition of the chicken feet and the house. When um when we get into the Christmas season, we should do an episode about Krampus. Oh, hell no! <laughs> <laughs> oh, Why do you hate me? <laughs> <laughs> so the Baba Yaga, that's hilarious. The name's funny. I don't think I've ever heard of that, and if I did, I probably had already forgotten about it. You probably just blocked it out of your mind because it was so <laughs> ridiculous to have a house with chicken feet. Are you serious? Yeah. So, Moving on to my number one, uh, my most favorite worldwide urban legend is Area 51. Ding! (laughs) (laughs) There has been so much that just grows off of this military installation, which was actually started, uh, I want to say, the early 50s by the CIA, who had already had land out there. And it started as kind of a secret place to run the U-2 project. Now, they tie it into the Roswell crash from 1947. However, that was rumored to have stored the um, the remains of the, the alien bodies in the actual craft itself up at Wright-Patterson. So Area 51 got built in the 50s at the height of the Cold War. We needed a place to, to test some secret aircraft. Right. So mm-hmm. allegedly, they moved all of the alien artifacts and everything from Wright-Patterson to Area 51, allegedly. And it did not come into 
mainstream media until 1989 when this nerdy dude named Bob Lazar came forward and said he had worked out there and he had seen alien spacecraft and bodies and everything. And he was just <laughs> so weird and awkward. You wanted to believe, but you didn't know if you should believe him. And to this day, he's still really strange. And you can't be like, oh, I believe him. Or you're like, hmm. It, it's just really strange. But Bob Lazar is the one that brought it to our attention. And since then, pop culture has taken off and adopted Area 51 is such oh, a huge piece of the UFO Americana puzzle where I just love everything about it. I've met several people who maybe have worked down there. Nobody ever talks about it. You don't ask about it. And it's referred to as downrange. So if somebody ever says, yeah, I work downrange, you just know that. And, and you, don't, you leave it alone. You just leave it alone. It's <laughs> super, it, to this day, it's super secret. Um, I, I had actually spent some time in the intelligence community and never came close to anything like this. And I probably never will. I think it's really a fascinating piece of American history. And I would like to know the truth, even though it could potentially be... Um, disappointing however comma three months ago or four months ago whatever when we were like in the very first part of the corona pandemic thing the pentagon and cia came forward saying that they were going to release documents and saying that they had position or possession <laughs> of alien vehicles uh -huh. then so that's my my number one very very cool it's it and and you know what? It transcends just an urban legend. It has become part of Americana. It really has. Absolutely. It's, uh, you know, I, I had, you remember when Independence Day first came out? I had cousins asking me, where is Area 51? And I'm like, dude, you're watching a movie. I didn't want them to be like, you know, <laughs> I, I know the hung up on it. Came out. And I've always been so intrigued by it and it's rumored now that there's no longer any ufos down there anymore that it's kind of like a distraction uh-huh everything's moved to another base but i don't know i like to think everything's still down there i mean the department of the interior gave up a lot of land that people were actually using as a surveillance point and turned that over to them so now that's restricted right so, you know something something's going on down there and of course, the United States has always loved to use disinformation as a weapon. So when we were at the height of the Cold War, developing fighter planes like the U-2 was a big deal. That was called Operation Oxcart, by the way, if you want to Google that and learn more yes, about it that. Yes, it was. So at the time, the U.S. Air Force had their Project Blue Book open. And we were also trying, we were in this super heated arms race with the Russians. So the U.S. government thought, hey, these assholes are talking about flying saucers. Let's just roll with it. So that's how we kind of got into the art of disinformation. Look at this hand. We've got kooky stuff over here. Meanwhile, on your right hand, you're, you're doing top secret shit. So that, that's a, a big possibility. Mm -hmm. In my yeah. heart, I believe that they really do have alien artifacts and bodies out there. I... I don't doubt it. And I'm okay with never knowing. I'm, I'm good with that. I mean, it doesn't bother me one way or another. I believe the truth is out there, et cetera, et cetera. I love the X-Files. <laughs> uh, oh, and if you want to um, read something kind of creepy, Google Jackie Gleason and Richard Nixon. They were friends, and apparently one night, Nixon picked Gleason up and took him to go see alien bodies. Just Google it, read about it. We don't have time to get okay. into it. Okay. Okay, I will be doing that. So, and with that, we need to wrap up because we've gone over again. Again? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Lou. Uh, all right. Tell us. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Aggie Rican or at my cocktail account at Aggie the Barkeep. And you can find me Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern right here on KLRN doing a podcast with um, my good friend Brad Slager called A Pod Divided. And Friday nights here with my best bud, Mickey, doing He Said, She Said at 8.30 p.m. 
Eastern time. Oh, it's and do you? You can always find me, Mickey Blowtorch, on Twitter at Mickey Blowtorch. The only piece of social media I will ever set foot on because I can be a total asshole or a cool guy. So come follow me. It's a fun time. And uh, so tonight I want to try out a new uh, closing line. You want to hear it? I practiced it this afternoon and I thought you might like it. Okay. Are you ready for this? Am I ever ready for you? (laughs) New closing line. uh, You're not. New closing (laughs) for every episode is Good Night America. Keep your tits dry.